this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to the 65th episode already of the reading, uh, the study, the study I should say, because reading is a reading of two different books actually. It is um, End Time Delusions by Steve Wahlberg and it is Exploding the Israel Deception by Steve Wahlberg right now. The point is that this is a very deep study and it is mostly based on these books or these books which are a foundation. And then we use the Bible as the other foundation. We measure everything in that book against the Bible. The Bible is the AV 1611 King James Bible for Tom Fress and me, because we understand that that is the only true, uncorrupted Bible, the Word of God in the world that we live in today. And we measure everything that is written in the book against the Bible. And if it doesn't hold up, we tell you, that the Bible is more important than anything any man wrote, and we tell you the truth concerning the Bible. And the truth is so important in this matter because we are dealing with Israel. We are dealing with a very little country in the Middle East that is hyped by all of the world as something quote-unquote Christian today in the world, and we tell you that it is not. It is anti-Christian and there is a delusion about it that needs to be exposed. The bomb needs to be exploded in the brains of the people who think that Israel, the state of Israel today, has anything to do with any biblical true prophecy of a country, of a nation state in these times. And this lie is the result of the greatest lie since the Garden of Eden of futurism. And that is what Tom ex excels in, in that subject, because he studied it deeply for years and years and years. I am quite new to it, but it's all that I studied so far, mainly. And I think that futurism 
is the biggest bomb in the minds of the people. A bomb where Satan loves to hold the trigger. And um, we want to give the trigger to God. And we want to expose the real truth behind the nation state of Israel. We want to expose the real truth to tell you who are the real Israelites. And that's why we are going to continue today in the book, uh, Chosen People, Choice or Chosen People, I think it is called. What's the name? Choice and the Chosen Nation. That's the name of the chapter we are still in on page 37 of the book, Israel, The Israel Explosion. Um, <laughs> the Israel Deception Explode, sorry. And I warmly welcome Tom Fress to the broadcast after this long introduction <laughs> of mine. Hello, Tom. And I'm yes. looking so much forward to do another broadcast. And thank you for coming along today. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm missing doing our broadcast together. I'm glad we can get together again today. And uh, I'm very appreciative and blessed to be here. And also uh, uh, my... Con my uh, uh, Acknowledgement of the listeners that are so important to uh, spreading the truth. Uh, listen, I have a subject. That I don't want. I know you want to get to the book, and so do I. That's why we're here. But I have a, a, a short explanation uh, that is long overdue, and I need to clarify things so people don't understand me, uh, don't misunderstand me. Um, I very much care about the Jewish people. I very much care about what the Bible calls Israel. And uh, uh, their souls are as important as mine in the overall scheme of things. And I'm willing to forgive and to forget that it was the Jews who slew their own Messiah. But God completely explains that, that they were blinded for our benefit, okay? They were spiritually blinded for our benefit. We are the beneficiaries of the uh, of the uh, temporary blindness of the Jews. And I believe God still has a plan for the Jews, the Hebrew people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But listen, it's not uh, the plan of God to deal with the Jews on the basis of a future 70th week of Daniel. That is the recreation of a modern nation state of Israel so that they can force Jews to live in the land, so that they can force Jews to build a temple, so that they can force Jews to reinstate animal sacrifices again so that they can eat and drink damnation to themselves. That's not God's plan for the Hebrew people. But yet that's what the, all the churches called Christian, which most of them are not Christian churches at all, and I'm going to name one because I'm not ashamed to name it. It's the Roman Catholic Church. It is not a Christian church. And anybody who says that Catholicism is a Christian religion has blasphemed the name of Christ. The Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan. It is the home and property of the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. And many of the so-called Protestant churches are not Christian churches either. They're just warmed over Roman Catholic churches. All right? And any church that teaches you that it is God's move, God is, God's hand of movement that has created this modern nation state of Israel in 1948, and Jews forced to live in the land, and Jews given permission to build a temple and to begin animal sacrifices, is not of God. God no longer dwells in temples made with hands. God no longer accepts the blood of lambs and goats and pigeons and doves to, for, for, for atonement of sin. God no longer depends upon an earthly uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant with the, the, an earthly uh, mercy seat. Okay? That's what we're all taught in the churches. The churches are liars. Okay? God has the same concern for Hebrews, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as he does for Gentiles. He would that we all came to repentance. But the Jew has to come to repentance the same way the Gentiles do. 
receiving their Jewish Messiah, accepting the blood of their precious lamb that was slain for them in the midst of the week, the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy 2,000 years ago. That's when salvation came to the Gentile. That's when salvation came to the Jew. Okay? So they have to accept the blood that was shed for them by God himself, the blood of his own precious son. Now, if you love the Hebrews, if you love the Jews like I do, you pray for them that they will accept the blood that was shed for them by Jesus on the cross 2,000 years ago, that they receive the propitiation for their sins, the Jesus who bore upon his body their sins and paid the atonement for their sins and redeemed them to God, reconciled them to God, put away sin forever, gave us on earth a, 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 a heavenly eternal kingdom wherein dwelleth righteousness. We all are partakers of the kingdom that was opened unto us the day that Christ said, it is finished. Our salvation had been accomplished. The promise that had been made to Adam and Eve in the garden was fulfilled 2,000 years ago by the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. That's the same salvation that we receive that is the only salvation for Jew or Gentile. And it has nothing to do with a modern refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. That is a Roman Catholic lie. And it is believed and taught and preached by every church, whether it's Catholic or Protestant in this country and in Europe. And as far as I know, around the world. It's the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And, 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 our, and our author, friend, who has written this book, comprehends exactly what I'm telling you. And he wrote a book about it, and that's why we're featuring this book. Futurism is a lie. It was cooked up by Satan himself. It has been propagated by the Roman Catholic Church, by the Jesuits, to deceive the whole world and to destroy Protestantism. Because... How does it destroy Protestantism? Because Protestantism was built originally on the belief, the fact, that Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. Every pope in succession, from the very first pope to the very last pope, is the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. That is the belief of Protestantism. You don't believe that? You cannot be a Protestant. You're not going to protest the pope if you don't believe the pope is the Antichrist, right? So if you believe in futurism, you don't believe the popes have always been the Antichrist. You believe in a single individual that doesn't come until just before Christ's literal return. He'll be some rich politician to look a little bit like Mitt Romney, you know, and, and he'll be a, a, po a political leader. He'll be a, possibly a Jew, and he will rule and reign, okay? That's, that's all Rome's fabrication. The papacy is was and always will be the Antichrist. The papacy has ruled over God's heritage for all throughout the entire Christian history. Okay? We've all been made subjects of the Holy Roman Pontiff through civil law. Okay? We've all been made to obey not God, but anti God, the papacy, the Antichrist. Okay? And people just don't want to believe that. People just don't want to believe that. It's easier to believe in a future Antichrist that hasn't come yet. We don't have to be concerned if we believe in a future Antichrist. Most of us are probably going to die before this future Antichrist comes anyway. You see how easy they sold us this future Antichrist pipe dream? And of course, to fulfill the 70th week of Daniel all over again, there has to be a modern nation state of Israel. There has to be Jews living in the land to make a, a necessary call for the building of a, a rebuilding of the temple, so that they can be re, regain, so that they can begin again to uh, sacrifice animals for their atonement. Seeing how they rejected the lamb that God sent for them and sacrificed for them, they rejected him. So they have to return to animal sacrifices again. The Jews have been without a sacrifice for 2,000 years. You know, 
So, so does that mean God loves them to leave them without a sacrifice? The truth of the matter is they have not been without a sacrifice. Jesus is and always will be the sacrifice for the Jews, just like he's the sacrifice for the Gentiles. And for 2,000 years, they could have accepted him just like the Gentiles do. They're not locked out of the kingdom of heaven. They've locked themselves out. Now, I love the Jews. I care for the Jews. Paul even said that he would give up his own salvation for the salvation of his Jewish brethren. That's important for us to realize. And we need to pray for the Jews that they receive the blood that was shed for them 2,000 years ago, that they might believe in the same Jesus that we believe in, that we be one in spirit, the great Israel of God. But instead, the whole world is looking for a future nation state of Israel, a rebuilding of a temple, and the return of the Jews to animal sacrifices. That is not the will of God. This is common sense, people. I'm not telling you something that, that I've uh, drawn out of a tuna can. This is reality. The idea that there's a modern nation state of Israel with Jews living in the land can only be the result of the, of the cooperation of the nations of, and the militaries of the world in cahoots with the papacy to, ju to jury rig an apparent refulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. And what does that do? That denies that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. That is the denial that the Messiah has come in the flesh. Do you want the papacy to be able to deceive you into saying with your mouth, whether you believe it or not, but saying with your mouth, the 70th week of Daniel hasn't come yet. The 70th week of Daniel hasn't been fulfilled yet. That is exactly the same as saying Messiah has not yet come. And what does the Bible say about that? If you deny that Jesus has come in the flesh, that is the spirit of Antichrist. That's what the Bible says. And that's what you admit to every time you say the 70th week of Daniel is future. That we need a modern nation state of Israel. We need Jews living in the land so that they can build a temple and begin to make sacrifices for the Christ that they rejected 2,000 years ago. The whole Christian world wants the Jews to eat and drink damnation to themselves. This is a critical situation that God's people need to be aware of and, correct, and to correct themselves of this error before it's too late. Now that I've said my piece, uh, you know, people, people only hear the tenor of my voice. They don't hear what I say. But, uh, but how do you speak of something so dastardly, so diabolical, in just common, ordinary, conversational tones. How does one deal with this subject in a, just a normal conversational tone? This is ecstatic emergency situation for the Hebrew people. Now, if I didn't care about the Hebrew people, maybe I could speak about this in conversational tones. But the lie that has been sold in all the churches, all the churches, is enough to damn the soul. It's enough to damn the soul. And it's taught in all the churches. Now, somebody convinced me that that's not something to raise your, your blood pressure about. And I have to suggest to my critics if your blood pressure isn't raised over this, if the tenor of your voice isn't raised over this, you simply don't understand the gravity of the situation. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. That was a very good inauguration into our reading today. And I uh, suggest that we go on with the text right now that we have prepared. Last time we were ending, uh, we ended on page 37 of the book. Um, math was never my favorite, the author says, so, uh, my, 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 never my favorite subject in school, and I told you that was mine neither. Uh, 
Yet we must apply ourselves to some mathematics, and I say no, it's rather calculations, in order to understand this particular prophecy. 70 weeks mean 490 days. God said to Ezekiel, who was a contemporary of Daniel, quote, I have appointed thee each day for a year. In Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6. The 70 week prophecy must be, quote, a day for a year, unquote, because it would reach down hundreds of years to the coming of the Messiah. Thus, 490 days equals 490 years. Now, when did it start? And therefore, of course, you already saw the chart that I put in here during Tom's explanation. And there's only one little thing we could talk about, but I don't think it is important enough to really stand long on it. There is a way we in our world today count the years, and there is a way that God counts the years. We are used to use a calendar that is split up in BC, means the time before Christ, and AD means uh, even Latin, Anno Domini, the time, uh, year of our Lord, that is the time after Christ has come. But that's not how God reckons time. God starts with day one and he ends with the last day, or the last year. So when there is a little um, confusion, and sometimes it says AD 26 instead of AD 27, or Jesus Christ was born 3, A, 3 BC or 4 BC or 5 BC, um, you have to take that with a grain of salt because we are used to use a calendar that is not godly. And that is also always, of course, um, the plan of the Antichrist, to throw us off in the time and to throw us off into un, uh, unimportant discussions, to take our eyes off the focus of the subject. And the focus of the subject is, Jesus Christ came about 2000 years ago, walked on the earth for three, 33 years in flesh, was crucified, buried, rose on the third day and went to heaven and sits now on the right hand of God in heaven. And three and a half years after his resurrection, the gospel went to the Gentiles because Stephen, as the last quote-unquote prophet of Israel, was stoned. I just want to make the point that when you ever see the chart here with the, day, with the years in it, or any other chart with those years in it, don't forget that God starts to count on the first day and he counts until the very last day of the last year of this world. He doesn't use terms of BC and AD because God is not the God of confusion. But the Antichrist who gave us this calendar, even that we are using now, because we actually, I have to admit, I don't know the real calendar, but the God of this eon, as it is called in Greek, means this time of the world, the Antichrist, was already foretold by Daniel that he would change, or see, that, that he would, no, that, not that he would change, that was not correct, but that he would think to change times and laws for us, to make it for us difficult to understand. So the question that the author poses here, when did it start, is very simple. Doesn't matter what year it was, it was long, long, long ago in history, and it was when Jesus Christ was born and then fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel in the last three and a half years of his earthly, fleshly life. Is there something that you want to comment on, Tom, on what I just said in this regard? Yes, I would like to elaborate this way. Look, Satan has done everything he can possibly do so that we may not positively mark the beginning of this prophecy so that we may not calculate the precise timing of the coming of the Messiah. But you must understand, Daniel was given this prophecy so that anyone could precisely time the, 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 the first advent of, of Jesus, Messiah the Prince. Okay, that's what it was all about. Daniel wasn't confused. We're confused in our generation because Satan wants to confuse us. 
and he wants to even put into question whether or not Jesus was the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. And I've already explained enough to you uh, in our introduction for you to understand what this is really all about. It is to bring into question whether or not Jesus was Messiah the Prince. That's what it's all about. And I reiterate, if you say the 70th week of Daniel is future, you have denied that Jesus is the Christ. You have denied that Messiah the Prince came 2,000 years ago in the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. That's the truth. You can't have it both ways. You cannot believe, it's impossible to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the, the, the prophesied coming Messiah, if you believe the 70th week of Daniel is future. You cannot have it both ways. And yet that's what's taught in all the churches, all of them. So when you say the 70th week of Daniel, when you're expecting a, a, a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, you have literally denied that Jesus was the fulfillment, that Jesus was the Messiah 2,000 years ago. That's exactly what is accomplished by changing times and laws. Now, let me make a simple solution that anybody and everybody can readily understand. We're not going to get into the, the specific date when the command was given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem because Satan has confused that. He used Sir Robert Anderson to confuse the issue. What I'm telling you is if you read the New Testament and you see the perfect and complete fulfillment of that prophecy as recorded in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, the 70th week of Daniel, then you have your fulfillment. And they can present to you any calendar they want. They can present to you any reckoning of time that they want. They're all liars because you can read the New Testament and with Daniel's prophecy on a three by five card in your left hand, you can read the New Testament with your right hand and you can mark every fulfillment in the New Testament that fulfills the 70th and final week of Daniel. And it begins with Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan and it ends with the stoning of Stephen and the going forth of the gospel to the Gentiles. Seventy weeks were determined upon thy people, Israel, and, and thy holy city. That's the Jews and Jerusalem. And when the Jews rejected Messiah for the last time after the testimony of Stephen, the gospel went to the Gentiles. It never remained with the Jews. Jerusalem and the Jews were destroyed. Okay? You want to know if the 70th week of Daniel is over? Just ask Yerk, and here's what he'll tell you. The gospel has gone forward to the Gentiles. That's how you know the 70th week of Daniel is over. Now, what's this cockamamie talk about a future 70th week of Daniel? You see how they've confused you? Do you understand how merciful it is for God to send someone like Yerk or myself to tell you that the 70th week of Daniel is over? That God is expressing his compassion for you. He knows you've been sold a lie, a damnable lie, and he doesn't want you to buy it anymore. The gospel has gone to the Gentiles. It has been with the Gentiles for 2,000 years. Why? Because the 70th week of Daniel is over. The seven-year ministry of Messiah in Jerusalem for the Jews is over. That's why the gospel went to the Gentiles. Now, our concern is that the Jews be grafted back in. How are they going to do that if they're going to build a temple in Jerusalem and sacrifice animals again? That's not believing in Jesus. 
That's what they did 2,000 years ago when they rejected Jesus. They had no option but to return to animal sacrifices. And that's why God had the temple destroyed in 70 A.D. and Jerusalem returned, reduced to a smoking hole in the ground. And every Jew was destroyed, if not scattered, into the nations. And it's been our commission as Gentiles, Christian Gentiles, to woo the Jews back to embrace their Jewish Messiah, who they wickedly slew on the cross 2,000 years ago. We are only saved because the gospel came to us. Now we have to give it back to the Jews. But God Almighty, don't send them back to Israel to sacrifice animals again. And that's what all the churches are doing to us. And that's what Yerk and I are here for. That's what uh, our author is here for in his book. This is critical information. It's as important of information that you've ever heard in your life. And you need to pay attention. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. So <clears throat> we are going back. When did it start? The author asks. Gabriel tells us in the text in the next verse, quote, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, unquote, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Persia conquered Babylon in 538 BC. Then King Cyrus issued a decree for the Jews to return to their land and to rebuild their temple, as we can read in Ezra, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, where it says, quote, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of, the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, he is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver, and with gold, and with goods, and with beasts, besides the free will offering of for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all them whose spirit God hath raised to go up to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, and with beasts, and with precious things, besides all that was willingly offered. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of, Jeru uh, of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem, and had put them in the house of his guards. Even those did Cyrus king of Persia bring forth, by the hand of Mithridath the treasurer, and numbered them to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And this is the number of them, thirty charges of gold, a thousand charges of silver, nine and twenty knives, thirty basins of gold, silver basins of a second sword, four hundred and ten, and other vessels a thousand. All the vessels of gold and of silver were five thousand and four hundred. All these the Chesbazar bring up with them of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. Now this was not only verse 1 through 3, that was the whole chapter of Ezra, uh, chapter 1. And I think it is quite important that we read all of it to understand what all had been done in the name of the Lord to restore the temple and Jerusalem in the time after the Babylonian captivity. Because we are clearly speaking of the time after the Babylonian captivity. We are not speaking of the time 2000 years later when another state of Israel was quote unquote born. The city of Jerusalem was quote unquote rebuilt and we are still waiting in 2021 where we live today 
of the inauguration of the temple. That is not biblical, but anti-biblical, anti-Christ. Later, King Darius issued another decree that led to the completion of the temple, and we read that in Ezra chapter 6. And I also have a few verses here for you prepared, where it reads, Then Darius the king made a decree, and search was made in the house of the rolls, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. Moreover, I make a decree, what ye shall do to the elders of these Jews, for the building of his house of God, for this house of God, that of, the kiss, uh, that of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, forthwith expenses be given unto these men, that they be not hindered. Still later, King Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah permission to rebuild the wall around the city. And we read that in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 3, and in chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. So, Nehemiah chapter 1. And they said unto me, the remnant, uh, let me just change the picture, as long as I read the Bible, I want to have the picture of the Bible here next to us. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And Nehemiah chapter 2, up to verse 9, says, and it came to pass, in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine, and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time set in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then... I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad, when the city, the place of my father's sepulchre, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? And the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favour in thy sight, that thou wouldst send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father, Sepulchus, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over uh, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the, king, uh, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertained to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I came to the governors beyond the river, and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. Yet, the author continues, the predicted commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem did not occur until Persian king Artaxerxes issued a lengthy decree giving Ezra official authority to set magistrates and judges over Jerusalem and to execute judgment upon all who refused to follow the laws of God and the king uh, follow the laws of God and the king. We read that in Ezra chapter 7, verses 21, 25, 26. Quote, And I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, do make a decree to all the treasures with, which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you, it be done speedily. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God, that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. 
and whosoever will not do the law of thy God, and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death, or to banishment, or to confiscation of goods, or to imprisonment. This was the only decree which fully restored civil authority to Jerusalem and to the Jewish state. That commandment occurred, quote, in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, unquote. We read that in Ezra chapter 7, verse 7, where it says, And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanims, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, the king. The date was 457 BC, as many Bibles state in the margin of Ezra chapter 7. Now Gabriel said, quote, From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, which is, and we explained that abundantly, 49 years, and three score and two weeks, which is 434 years, unquote. Daniel 9.25. So, even when you can do the math in your head, take out your calculator and see 49 plus 434 equals 483. Going forward, 483 years from 457 BC comes to AD 27, the time of Messiah the Prince. Keep in mind, as I told you before, God does not count in BC and AD, so you will have Mary, uh, maybe various times mentioned here, mentioned there, but it's about the point that is being made. It is about the time of Messiah the Prince. That is what counts. Let me reiterate, Yerk, yeah, that the most accurate calculation of time in this in in this situation concerning Daniel's prophecy is in the literal English text of the New Testament. When you read in English the New Testament, the King, the authorized King James Bible, and you read the perfect and complete fulfillment of every jot and every tittle of Daniel's prophecy, then you know the 70th week of Daniel is fulfilled. Okay? You don't have to worry about all these other uh, calendars, all these other reckonings of time. You can ignore what Sir Robert Anderson says. You can ignore what Eric John Phelps says. You can ignore all of these fools. The Bible is a divinely inspired, infallible, historical record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of every jot and every tittle of Daniel's prophecy. And if you can read the New Testament without recognizing that this is the purpose of the New Testament to record the historical fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, then you're a marvel and a mystery. Because that's what it's for. The New Testament records the coming of Messiah the Prince. I think, Tom, what we just read with the texts in the book is, uh, I, I speak of the, of the book, of course, of the Bible, with the text of the Bible I just read from the different chapters from Ezra and Nehemiah. Yep. Yep. I think, you know, God had a reason why he didn't point any years or something into the time when that happened. Um, the time is just for us to measure things that were prophesied in the Bible. Have they been fulfilled in the past? Yeah. And there is no doubt that all of these things we just read in the Bible have been fulfilled. The Bible tells us they were fulfilled and even history tells us they were fulfilled. Whatever date history puts on it is of no avail to us. That's right. It has been fulfilled. That That's means right. the 70th week of Daniel has started mm -hmm. and has finished. You and want a perfect reckoning of time? If you want a perfect reckoning of time, then you have to accept God's reckoning of time. And that reckoning of time is exposed and revealed in the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy as it is recorded in the New Testament. Now you have a perfect 
reckoning of time. You don't need to know if it's 27 AD. You don't need to know when the going forth the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. You didn't know needed. You don't need any help from Sir Robert Anderson. You don't need any help from any theologian, any doctor, any doctor of divinity, any uh, soothsayer. You've got the truth in black and white in your hands in the authorized King James Bible, and you know that this is the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. And you don't really care at that point what year it is, do you? Listen, I don't care. Let the experts argue and fight and try to confuse people. Let the popes, the Gregorian calendar and the and 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 the, whatever Pope had the previous calendar, Julian escaped, calendar, Julian calendar. You can let all men make as many calendars as they want. Do you realize they're all just kindling for the fire? When God gives us a reckoning of time, God did give us that perfect reckoning of time in the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy two thousand years ago. You know what day it is. You know what year it is. You know what time it is. It's the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. That's the only thing that matters to you. This is Messiah the Prince. He dotted every I. He crossed every T in Daniel's prophecy. Either that or you don't know how to read. The New Testament is, is, is just a count by count, multiple witnesses. You know, the Bible plainly tells us, it, let two or three witnesses judge, establish everything. The, the New Testament is witness after witness after witness that Jesus reconciled us to God, that Jesus gave us everlasting life, that Jesus reconciled us to God, brought in everlasting righteousness, fulfilled the 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 vision and the prophecy and anointed the most holy what more convincing do we need what experts do we need to correct us all the time about when this prophecy is going to be fulfilled and listen at by this point certainly anybody that suggests to you a future fulfillment is a laughing stock. You can laugh at his face. You can laugh him to derision. And that's every preacher in this country, with very few exceptions. Steve Wahlberg's one of them. Uh, you know, uh, Yerk's another. I'm another. There are some in this country. I've you know, come to realize that there are more and more people comprehending the historicist account of Bible prophecy and have abandoned futurism as the plague that it is. The abominable, damnable plague that it is. Satan is the author of all of it, and you must forget it and believe the historicist truth. You know, there's so many, oh, the, the, the Left Behind series of videos, they aren't even good kindling for the fire at this point. All they are is regrettable expenses. You spend a lot of money, a lot of time invested in those Left Behind series of videos, and you've done nothing but deceive yourself. The truth makes far more sense. The truth is historically recorded in the most infallible book you have in your possession. It's the New Testament of the authorized King James Version of the Bible. And at that point, you don't give a whit what other men say. Bless the name of the Lord, the truth teller for all the ages. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. Going forward, 483 years from 457 BC comes to AD 27, the time of Messiah the Prince. Now the word Messiah means anointed one. In AD 27, which was the very year specified in prophecy, Jesus Christ was quote-unquote anointed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism. And we read that, for example, in Matthew and in the book of Acts. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, and I probably added a few. 
we read, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Acts 10.38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Then Jesus said, The time is fulfilled. Repent ye and believe the gospel. We read that in Mark what? chapter 1 verse what, 15. What, yes, what, what time? What time is fulfilled, Yerk? <laughs> Tell time, everybody, what time is fulfilled? The time of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, That's verses 24 exactly through 27. Right. That time That's is fulfilled. That's exactly right. He's speaking of a specific time. That which prophesied his precise coming. The precise timing of his coming. You could mark a red X on the calendar. When Daniel finished his prophecy, you knew exactly when Messiah was coming. Whenever the commandment went forward to rebuild and restore Jerusalem, you know within a day when Messiah the Prince would come. No mistake. And, and, and the New Testament even records there were two that were waiting for Jesus on the steps of the temple when he came to be baptized by his mother and his stepfather. Yeah, Simeon and a woman, I think, called Anna or something. I think it was Anna, yeah. I think so she too. served in the temple all the time, yeah. and she was smarter than all the doctors, all the lawyers, all the priests, all the scribes, all the Pharisees, all the Sadducees. She knew when Messiah was coming. They didn't. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, you know, Tom, it says here in Mark chapter 1, and saying, the time is fulfilled. And you said, yeah, what time? Well, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 starts with, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. That is time. And it's exactly that time that is fulfilled. Seventy weeks are right. determined. That time is fulfilled. You can't, see, you can't say it any clearer. That's right. I, I don't know how anybody can read this and not understand it. What time is fulfilled? Everybody who reads the gospel, who reads Mark chapter 1 verse 15, has to ask himself, what time is he speaking about? Of this course. is exactly what should be preached from the pulpits of all the churches. Yeah, should be. And, you can and count on one hand the churches that preach the truth. Should be, yeah, absolutely. Mark 1.15, please, let, let us read it again. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Jesus knew that he was fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. And everyone around him and with him should have known it too. The total period mentioned by Gabriel in Daniel 9.24 was quote-unquote 70 weeks or 490 years. Gabriel then subdivided this total period into three smaller periods of seven weeks in verse 25, 62 weeks in verse 25, and one week in verse 27. So we have seven weeks plus 62 weeks plus one week, and that equals 70 weeks. We have seen that seven weeks plus 62 weeks brings us down to AD 27, the time of Christ's anointing as the Messiah. That leaves one final week of the prophecy. Now Gabriel said, quote, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. That's the 70th week of Daniel. He shall confirm the covenant with many 
for one week, a seven-year period of time. He will confirm the covenant. What covenant? A covenant that God made with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When he made a sacrifice of a lamb and he, co he covered Adam and Eve with the coats of skins. Okay? God has told the ending from the very beginning, the covenant in Christ's blood. And until that day came, in so-called 27 AD, what had to suffice to that point was animal sacrifices. The same type of sacrifice that Jesus made in the Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve that foretold the eventual redemption of mankind through the shed blood of the Lamb of God on Calvary's cross in the midst of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. When you see in this book, it says one week, you know it's talking about the 70th week because first there were seven weeks, then 62 weeks. Does seven weeks equal one week? Uh-uh. Does 62 weeks equal one week? No. 62 and 7 is 69. That leaves one week. And what week is that? Everybody, class, the 70th and final week of the 490-year prophecy. One seven-year period to go. He was anointed at the very beginning in his baptism. When, he, when, when John the Baptist baptized him, three and a half years later, his blood was shed. The covenant was perfected. It was, it, was, it was confirmed. You can't con confirm a covenant any better than actually performing the, con the covenant, and that's what he did. His blood was shed. That's how you confirm the covenant, a covenant that has always been with man, established in the Garden of Eden. That covenant was confirmed in the midst of the 70th and final week when Jesus became the lamb that he promised mankind that he would be. And our sins are washed away. Praise his holy name. And if you think you need to make any other further sacrifices, you've simply rejected the sacrifice that Jesus made for you. Do you hear that, Roman Catholics? Do you hear that, Lutherans? All of you so-called Protestant churches out there that believe in the real presence of the elements of, blood, of, 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 of bread and wine or the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ, you're making a sacrifice when you, when you partake of communion. That is a rejection of the sacrifice that Jesus made. You're no different than a Jew on Temple Mount when he sacrifices a lamb or a goat or a pigeon or a dove. You have, you have forsaken the blood of Christ. You have forsaken the covenant that Jesus confirmed in the midst of the 70th and final week. Let every Christian denomination in this world, by whatever name they call themselves, repent of this presence in the Eucharist. Because there's no way that you can deny that what you are doing is a sacrifice. And you, when you make a sacrifice, you eat and drink damnation to yourself. You want to re instantly recognize any false church anywhere in the world, all you have to do is look and see if they make a sacrifice. And you know to turn around and run. Okay? Better for you to just get out of all the churches. And I'm going to tell you why. People just instantly recoil when they hear me tell them to get out of the churches. Every Protestant and evangelical church is being taught little by little to begin to regard the, 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 the communion table as a sacrament. Okay? That's Roman Catholic legalism for a, 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 a sacrifice whereby grace is earned. Okay? You're becoming little by little Roman Catholic. You're, you're being taught that, the, that the, the elements of bread and wine on the communion table now have the real presence of Christ within them. That although it still appears to be bread and wine, it smells like bread and wine, it tastes like bread and wine, 
And it, for all intents and purposes, is the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ to be crucified, sacrificed all over again on the altars of the churches. Now you've eaten and drunk damnation to yourself. Every church in this country is instructed by its pastors and priesters to convert you to Roman Catholicism so that the whole world can share a quote-unquote common communion. It's an abomination that makes desolate, okay? And I'm warning you, there isn't a church that's going to be exempt from this except the home churches, those who meet in private, in secret. The established churches of this country are going to conform to this Roman Catholic construct of a sacrifice, and it's being done little by little. And they're making Roman Catholics of all of us. And you've got no hope if you stay in the churches. At some point, you're going to become thoroughly dissatisfied with what's taking place in the churches. Better that you get out now and learn the truth. Okay? I hate to be, you know, sound so dogmatic about this. But when you come to understand this, you, you'll wonder why I spoke in such mild terms about it. Back to you, York. I have a question to you, Tom. Yes. Well, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, it says, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Where in all of the prophecy of Daniel is a covenant established? The point is, when the Antichrist makes Daniel chapter 9, especially verses 24 through 27, future, saying that the coming Antichrist shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, I ask, what covenant? Yeah. Does the Antichrist have power to make a covenant in God's name? You can only confirm a covenant that is pre-existing. That's exactly right. But there is no Antichrist ever making a covenant with anyone in this world. So how can he confirm a covenant with many for one week in this, even if they play the 70 week of Daniel according to their terms again? How can he right. confirm a covenant that is not even made? Now, my understanding, they're trying to dummy me up this thing and that this seven year uh, peace treaty already exists. It's already known about and discussed, uh, and they're just waiting for the proper time. Yeah, but time then that antichrist, unquote, that antichrist has to sign that covenant before he breaks it. Yeah. But that's in the that's same right. 70 weeks. So in, yeah. in the same 70 years week. But here it only speaks about that he confirms a covenant that already exists. They have to put that covenant in the same 70 years week, and that is also, well, just... that is also a point on where you can recognize the lie. Just counting on the ignorance of the people and the pastors and priesters of their churches are going to make sure they're just as ignorant as they need to be to buy into this future 70th week. Every Christian has the possibility to understand that only God made a covenant with his people. That's right. And he can confirm that covenant with many for one week. Yep. And he determined that 490 years are going to pass before he does that, or 486 and a half, if we are yep. correct, because he confirmed the covenant when he went to the cross. Huh? Look, that, that covenant was confirmed on the cross. Yeah, that's what I say. That, that, was, that covenant was, was made in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, and made in the Garden of the Eden cross. and confirmed at the cross. And right. Jesus even uh, foretold of the, the immediate confirmation of that of that covenant when he was asked by his apostle, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus said, no. I say not seven times, but 70 times seven times. That's how many times Jesus forgave his brothers, the Jews. But the end was approaching. The confirmation of his covenant was imminent. And the end of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy was only three and a half years away. 
And then the gospel was going to be rejected by the Jews. The covenant was going to be rejected by the Jews. The eternal uh, uh, atoning blood of the Lamb of God was going to be rejected by the Jews and would be received with gladness by the Gentiles. Now you know what happened in history. Now you know precisely when the 70th week of Daniel was and exactly what confirmation took place there on the cross in the midst of the 70th and final week. It was the covenant in Christ's blood that he made with Adam and Eve in the garden the day after they sinned. They tried to cover themselves with leaves, an inadequate covering, and so Jesus, the Lamb of God, foretold his own suffering when he slew an innocent animal and covered them with coats of skins. He foretold his own redemption. And when the time came and acknowledged by Jesus, this is the last time, what did he mean? The 70th week of Daniel was here. The end of the, of the 70th week of Daniel would result in the rejection of the blood of the Lamb and the going forth of the gospel and the blood of the Lamb to the Gentiles. Now, let's do the Jews a favor. Let's tell them about Jesus the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and how he made reconciliation for iniquity, how he brought in everlasting righteousness. Oh, you'll hear the expert tell you, oh, they didn't bring in, Jesus didn't bring in everlasting righteousness. We're still in sinful bodies. We still live in this world. But Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is among men. That's right. It's here and now, folks. We're looking in the future for something to happen that has already happened 2,000 years ago. They're liars. They're deceivers. They don't understand the gospel. They don't understand the historical reckoning of the New Testament. There's nothing left of Daniel's prophecy to be fulfilled, not even one jot or one tittle. They're all liars, they're all deceived, and they, they're deceivers. You shouldn't listen to them anymore. You've heard the truth for the first time with your own ears. What makes more sense? What pricks your conscience the most? The lies or the truth? You know the truth, whenever it is told, has a certain ring that cannot be denied. You know that 490 years was over, 2,000 years ago at the stoning of Stephen and the going forth of the, of the gospel to the Gentiles. Yerk said it perfectly. You want to know if that 490 years is over? All you have to do is determine when the gospel was rejected by the Jews and when it was taken by the apostles to the Gentiles. That is recorded in the New Testament for all posterity. The 70th week of Daniel is over. It was over 2,000 years ago. Now the question you have to ask is, well, if the 70th week of Daniel is over, that means it can't be future. And if they've been teaching us that the Antichrist is going to fulfill this future uh, 70th week of Daniel, then that's a false Antichrist, isn't it? So who's the real Antichrist? It's the one who was immediately revealed right after the great falling away that took place, only years, only years after Paul's demise, only years after Paul's death, just like he prophesied, there'd be ravenous wolves come in among the sheep and scatter the sheep. That's exactly what happened. All kinds of false doctrine, all kinds of false teachings, and it all culminated in a false Christianity called Roman Catholicism, headed up by the man of sin. And none of that could have taken place with the current government of Rome in place. It had to be taken out of the way, and it was taken out of the way, and the man of sin in the Vatican was exposed and has ruled and reigned over God's heritage and over the kings of the earth, slaying God's people for 2,000 years. And you've been lied to. 
You've been lied to all your Christian life. You know what I just told you makes more sense than anything you ever heard in a church. You can prove it by the New Testament, the written historical record. You cannot be lied to anymore. And you can bless the God of creation for revealing it to you. Now go forth and tell the truth. Don't hide your candle under a bushel. The whole world has gone astray. It's all gone Roman Catholic. It teaches a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel, which denies that Jesus was the Christ. I can't make more sense to you than I've made. It's bubble tight, as they say. There's no room for error in this. Every accounting has been made. It's recorded in the New Testament. Nobody can lie to you anymore. You know you have the truth. What a blessing from God. But let me remind you once again, if you're offended by my speech, if you're offended by my, my, my dogmatism over this, and if you think I'm trying to look down my long nose at all of you, saying that you've been wrong all your life, I confess to you before God, before the world, I believe the same lies that you believe all my life. And it was only by the mercy of Almighty God right after, you know, as estimate sometime after my 50th birthday, God started opening my eyes to this reality. He sent me to the 70th week of Daniel as recorded in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. And I read it just like every other Christian reads it. It's going to be the Antichrist. It's going to sign a peace treaty with the Jews, let them build an, uh, build the temple again, and begin animal sacrifices again. But then I remembered in the New Testament that when Jesus gave up the ghost, God ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom. That threw open the Holy of Holies. And it was a, it was, it was a death sentence if you, if you went into the Holy of Holies without being the great high priest of Israel once a year. So that put an end to animal sacrifices. Just the very ripping of the temple veil from top to bottom put an end to animal sacrifices. You didn't dare go in there without blood and without first making a sacrifice to cover your own sins. You couldn't pass through that veil. That Holy of Holies was a death trap unless you were the great high priest of Israel once a year. And here it was laying wide open. Who's going to go in there? Nobody. Why? Because Jesus was sending the Jews and the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the whole religious gobbledygook in Israel that it had, the day had come. The fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy was over. There's no more need for sacrifices because Jesus, the Lamb of God, made reconciliation for iniquity. What are you going to sacrifice for if Jesus made reconciliation for iniquity? If Jesus brought in everlasting righteousness according to Daniel's prophecy, what do you need to make sacrifices for? You starting to get the picture? Do you start to understand why in 70 A.D., after the Jews rejected Jesus' blood and tried to sew the veil of the temple back up and reinstall, reinstitute animal sacrifices, that God sent the Roman 10th Legion to wipe that temple off the hill to save the Jews from eating and drinking damnation to themselves? Now, you ask your pastor next Sunday when you go to talk to this idiot why God changed his mind and wants the Jews to build a temple so they can be, begin animal sacrifices again. You ask him that question. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to hear what these idiots have to say. They can't answer the question. 
but they're going to keep teaching their lies anyway because it sells. Thank God for Steve Wolberg. Thank God for Yurt Glissman. Thank God for anybody that'll tell you the truth about the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. Because you need to hear it, and it makes all the difference. Back to you, Yurk. Now let's wrap it up. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 says. One week equals seven days, which means, in prophecy, seven years. This famous year seven period is often called the 70th week of Daniel. In the next chapter, we will focus our attention on this controversial 70th week. Controversial? Well, the 70th week of Daniel is not controversial. It is only taught in an unbiblical manner and so takes away the perfectness the Bible represents. Why so many people do not understand the fact Jesus fulfilled the 70th week is because they read the Bible with their church glasses on and the church, all churches worldwide, are controlled by Jesuitical seminars. I don't even touch the subject of the Jesuits here, but that their order was founded to destroy Protestantism and destroy the Word of God is unquestionable. One just has to take a look at the decrees made at the Council of Trent, and one does not even need any author to speak of the facts. Even if you call every author of the past 400 years writing on the subject a Roman Catholic bigot, a conspiracy theorist and what not, the decisions of the Council of Trent, as it was led by the Jesuits, are the fruits of their works. You do not need any other writings than just that. More of that in the next chapter. And that will be for our next reading, chapter 5, the 70th week of Daniel, delusion. And probably, of course, we spoke a lot about what is in that chapter spoken about already in this broadcast, but the truth cannot be repeated often enough because the lie is repeated even much more. Many more times, to say it in correct English, sorry. The lie is repeated many more times because so few people around the world speak the biblical truth. And Tom and I want to help you to see that truth by reading this book and discussing the subject Steve Wahlberg put up in his book Exploding the Israel Deception. Now, Tom, if you want to take over for a final comment on what we read and did today, then be my guest. And otherwise, I finish the video right here. I'll just leave the listeners with my uh, usual salutation. Blessings in the name of the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. The precious Lamb of God. The real and only King of kings and Lord of lords. Blessings in his precious name. I'll see you next week. We gather today on the eve of a historic anniversary to celebrate what happened here in this very hall 70 years ago when the United Nations declared to the modern world an ancient truth that the Jewish people have a natural, irrevocable right to an independent state in their ancestral and eternal homeland. Mr. Speaker, in these uncertain days, it's important that we cling to the permanent things and the ancient truths. Among them is the principle that fear is useless. What is needed is trust. As we prepare in the next hour to vote on H.R. 2975, the, the Patriot Act of 2001, uh, I rise as a proud member of the House Judiciary Committee to say this legislation is about trust. It is not about fear. It is about trusting the law enforcement authorities of this country with the powers 
some temporary, some permanent, to stop those who would wage war on our citizens before they level the attacks. We do not bring this legislation to this floor in fear. We bring this legislation to the floor in trust. We trust in God. We trust in the governing authorities that our God has placed for such a time as this. I urge all of my colleagues to join me in strongly supporting the Patriot Act of 2001. And I yield back the balance of my time. Forsaken God, give us a king. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba. And the sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways, now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties and will set them to ear his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be confectionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyard and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your main servants and your godliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. And he shall cry out in that day because of your king which he shall have chosen you and the Lord not hear you in that day. Nevertheless the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city.